So I welcome you all here. And uh, two to three weeks ago, I returned from Scotland. And you'll be hearing a bit about Scotland today. Because Scotland's moved itself into my life in a very interesting way. And during my time there, I had some experiences, which will uh, relate to you, which are unlike anything I've ever had in my life, uh, without any question. And uh, so I thought what I would do is not tell you any more about them until we get to the end of the rest of what I want to talk about. And then we'll go back there, because that's part of the evolution of this story, from the beginning of this channeling experience of mine to the most recent work in Scotland. Um, the story starts most easily at a time when Susan and I, my wife, were probably working here, actually, uh, deciding on whether or not to go to a John O'Donohue gathering in Ireland or to go and do a women's group that she wanted to do that was going to be traveling through England and Scotland to all of the sort of sacred places there. It turned out that the farther we got into the planning, the more determined she was, appropriately. And so we decided to go separate ways. I went to Ireland, and she went on this trip with just three people. And uh, I don't know how many places they went to in England and Scotland, but when they finished their journey, uh, Susan returned to London, and when she boarded the plane to come home, she boarded it and passed uh, in the plane on her way home. And depending on where you are with that and where I was with it, where the family was with it, it was disturbing, obviously. We worked our way through that, and about a year plus later, the family and I got together and their four adult children and said, why don't we, as a matter of honoring Susan's passage, and our own interest, asked the guide to take us on exactly the same trip through England and Scotland to all the same sacred places she went to. And so we did. <clears throat> and when we got to a little island off the west coast, known as Iona, which some of you may be familiar with or have heard of, little teeny island, um, we went to sleep one night, the first night we were there. We were there for two nights. And during the night, I had a dream. And the dream brought forward what are called the precepts. I knew nothing about the precepts. I had no idea what they were about. But there was a long listing of words, and these were the precepts. And I was also told in the dream, don't worry about it. Don't get up the way I might typically do and write down what I thought I remembered about the dream. Not important. You'll know it in the morning. And Sure enough, when I woke up, there they were, just as clear in my mind as it could be. And I thought, that's interesting because that's not my normal experience with that. And I wrote them all down. And I can feel that right now. The, uh, <clears throat> the, the family group got together that morning, and in tears I told them what had happened overnight. And uh, that was the beginning, <clears throat> essentially, of a journey that's ongoing, even to today, in its own way. The... Um, Family went on, we finished our, our trip. I had these precepts, and I went to work with a medium in Hawaii with them, and we started working on what was behind them. And essentially what they are is uh, the outline of a book in terms of chapter headings. And the book was about, it intended to be about, the history of ancient Scotland as it relates to the modern world. Specifically, they were interested in bringing forward through this dream and through people that call themselves the Bard and Bardess, information about what happened 4,500 years ago and farther back in this area in terms of societal organization, keywords, societal organization, because they were asking to bring out information that had been residing in the rocks, those stones and rocks of that place go back 2,000 million years. They're very, very old, some of the oldest rocks in the world. And unlike, <coughs> unlike most information that dissipates over time, and they were using the example of what the dam that they're building across in China 
Nobody will even remember the damless river there 500 years from now. But this information went back into the rocks and they were bringing it back out. And so that was the beginning of it, to, to, to identify the precepts. There's a copy of the precepts here for your information, edification, whatever. The work in Hawaii went along fairly well. And during some of that work, uh, I was guided to go to the next door house that I was renting and go up on the porch with a piece of paper and start writing. I thought, what's that about? So I had no idea what I was writing about. And the first thing that came to me was, as I was sitting there, because I did it, was don't pay any attention, this is, I'm, I'm hearing this, don't pay any attention to the noise nearby. They're just repairing the corrugated metal roofs that are so common to that part of Hawaii. And so we'll work past the noise, not to worry. I don't remember what else happened. I do remember that some time later, don't remember now how long how long that was, there were probably 20 pages or something that was written down. I could read it. I read it. It's just I'm not bringing it today because it's not important for today. What was important is that something had said, go there and write something from an internal hearing. I thought that's interesting. And I was guided to go back to Scotland, to this little island of Iona, and start writing. And I rented a place there and sat down each morning, I think after breakfast, maybe at 11 o'clock or something, took out a pad of paper and started writing. And the pages started flowing and flowing and flowing, uh, probably several hundred over two visits or so there. That material was subsequently worked on and we'll get back to that. But the, the point, key point there was that the idea of me being somehow inducted into the state of being able to write so what I'm hearing internally had obviously started. It was triggered originally by the time in Iona, was brought forward by the time in Hawaii back to Iona, and now is just pouring through that way. So let's just leave that where it is for a moment and go back over to Hawaii. You'll be hearing a lot about Hawaii. Um, there's a couple of beaches that are really sacred for me, and I drove one day into one of them in a car by myself early in the morning, and there's nobody else there. And I rolled the windows down, and there was a standard sort of bird up here talking loudly the way they do. And that was it, and some waves and some beautiful air blowing. And uh, I turned this iPod on because I'd moved from handwritten material to seeing if iPods would work. I thought, well, if that works, this might work. In fact, that iPod. The next thing I knew was I hear a voice saying, we need to stop now, you need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> How sacred. <laughs> Maybe not sacred, but damn practical. So I turned it off. In what sort of a daze I was in, I don't know. I sort of checked myself out, and yes, I did. Thank you. <laughs> and so I went over to my left, and I'll never forget it, a couple of porta potties that are typical along some of the coastline in Hawaii. Did what I needed to do, came back, turned the machine back on, and something like 40 minutes later or something, they said, we're done for today. Thank you. And that was the end of it. <clears throat> so what I got from that in terms of today's discussion wasn't material, which is fascinating, but I got today the idea that using an iPod, uh, I could go into a place of what I would call a full trance uh, and bring material through. Later in that same time there, I was walking near one of the Hawaiian sacred spots. And uh, I was walking toward it and came to a place where I couldn't move forward any farther, but I was still 20 feet or so away from a wall. And I was amazed at that. You could just feel it, like the wall was right there. But I couldn't move any further than that. And I started playing with it to see you know, what's going on here. Um, what I was finding out was that there are energetics <clears throat> that somehow wanted to show me things. And they were doing it. The, the use of the iPod, the full trance, all sorts of little pieces of information were being provided. If there's any question in my mind <clears throat> about what's going on, uh, <clears throat> it was eliminated. <clears throat> I could walk around it, 
but I couldn't walk through it. So I went back to uh, Hawaii again later, and uh, I was in Kihei, where I happened to own a condominium, and a voice came to me and said, it's time to write a book. I said, oh, really? And I hadn't thought about that in this sense. And it turned out to be my father. And he said, it's time to get a book written and is to be written by hand. So not that, but by hand. And I started writing in Kihei. Um, I don't know how many pages, thank you very much. I don't know how many pages uh, a day one might write, 10 or 15, maybe, maybe 20. Uh, and then whatever this information is, is coming through and who it's coming through becomes aware of tired arms, tired hands. Let's say that's enough for today, we'll catch you tomorrow, or whatever it turns out to be. So there's an acute awareness on both sides of this developing story of mine about what I'm doing in support of what's going on. And I would guess that by the time the next step was taken in this story, um, maybe months had gone by, I'd probably been to Hawaii several times. Um, the book uh, by this father of mine, who's, he's a bishop, Roman Catholic bishop, um, was probably three or four hundred pages at that point. And what he was saying is that we can't go forward with this, it's too big. So what we need to do is we'll take pieces of it out and make something we call a pamphlet out of it. And the pamphlet was to have pictures, sketches in it. And he loved, and so do I, sketches. So off we went into the world of sketches. Um, how that ever took place, I really don't know. Uh, I can sketch, but I don't consider myself an artist. And yet, over a period of a few months, and there are 25 sketches that were finished that support parts of the book story. He specifically didn't want them blended into the book because he said, there are people that are going to pick this book up who can't get it from the words, but will instantly get it from a picture. So leave the pictures there. Don't put any titles on them. Let them just sit in places. And he pointed out where they were to be.